Let us go ahead and get started this morning, brothers. Uh, so far in our series, we have been working through Genesis 1 and 2, right, looking at what it means to bear God's image as male and female, right? And if you remember session one, we opened up the series talking about uh, human uniqueness, our worth and our value as image bearers of God, as opposed to the rest of creation. We are different. We are unique, uh, both male and female. We are made in God's image. Uh, and we are made to be fruitful and to multiply and to di- take dominion in God's world. That's what we read in the creation story. And in that first session, we emphasize the common mission of God that he has both for both men and women uh, to glorify him in their work, in what they do. Right? And we, we pressed those realities in a little further even last week as we talked in more depth about what it means to bear God's image, right? Uh, Then in session two, Pastor Seth aimed largely at Genesis two to begin assessing the differences between men and women, right? We are not the same, we are different, both ontologically and economically, right? Remember with ontology, ontology, we're simply talking about essence, nature, being, as opposed to economy, which means our action, our work, the things that we do. Uh, Pastor Seth talked about the, the fact that in the, within the triune God, we can learn much about ontology by examining economy. Right? So we learn a lot about who God is based on what he does throughout human history. And then he pivoted to human beings, saying that the same will often be the case of us as, as image bearers. We can learn a lot about who we are by what God has made us to do. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to reteach his lesson from session two. It was great. If you have not heard it, I encourage you to go to YouTube and, uh, and listen to that. It was really encouraging. Uh, but there were a couple essential points that, that he landed on when it comes to the differences between men and women and what we are designed for. Pastor Seth concluded that man was fundamentally designed and created to protect and provide, to protect and provide. He drew this out from various principles throughout the creation narrative, Genesis 1 and 2. And in the same way, he showed us that that women were fundamentally created, as we see this in Eve, as a helper and a life giver, right? To, To be a helper and a life giver in accordance with God's good and perfect design. Uh, God created and and hardwired men and women uniquely for these functions, right? And so that's sort of session two in a nutshell. Um, And today what we wanna do, and and what we're trying to do with these these breakout sessions is just kind of press those realities in a little further um, as we think more practically in application. Um, So this morning, I have three points for us to consider. Three points for us to consider. Number one, we're going to talk about ways for us to be better providers, okay? Ways for us to be better providers. The second would then be ways for us to be better protectors. Ways for us to be better protectors. And then we'll finish by talking about ways that we can help others thrive in their callings as well. Okay, so let's start with ways that we can be better providers, right? Based on those principles that we were taught from the creation story, we were wired for this. So let's talk about ways that we can be better providers. First of all, we want to not neglect, or we want to not neglect that calling. We want to accept that calling as provider with faith and obedience and joy. So step one, how to be a better provider, be a good provider. Right? You want to accept that calling that God has given you. Don't pawn this responsibility off to someone else. Right? Receive it from the Lord as an obedient, joyful man of God. You were called to provide. Adam was commissioned to work and to keep the garden that God placed him in. Right? That was his call. God expected Adam to cultivate and develop the ground and yield a harvest for his family. There was a reason, there was was an end to that work, and it was to provide. 
And we'll see this uh, in the next couple of weeks as we begin studying the fall of Genesis 3, how he, how he failed in that mission, and how we can tend to have a, a tendency toward avoiding our responsibility. Again, we'll see that next week. Um, but, but the point is we want, to, we want to accept our calling, what God has called us to be as a provider, and not neglect that. 1 Timothy 5 in verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's what the Word of God says, right? So we want to take that, we want to take that seriously. So if you have a household, right, if you have anyone at all who depends on you, who's under your authority as the head of the household, it's your responsibility to see to it that they have what they need, very practically speaking, right? And here we're fundamentally talking about the basics of clothing and food and shelter. These, these basic needs should be a no-brainer when it comes to what we strive to provide for our Households. I don't think I'm teaching us anything new here today. Um, but I think we can also logically conclude that, that you don't have to have a wife and children for this to be applicable to you. Logically, even if your household is just you at this point, if you're, if you're not taking care of yourself and working hard to provide for your own needs, how will you be prepared and able to provide for anyone else's needs? We need to provide for ourselves as well. So as men in the image of God, we should take pride in the calling God has given us to be providers. We should do it with joy and with skill and with our best, our best strength. Right? Which leads to the, the next point. We need to discipline ourselves for hard work. We need to discipline ourselves for hard work. Don't expect it to be easy to provide. Again, we don't live in the pre-fall world anymore, right? And so making our way and providing for the needs of ourselves and others is a, it's a difficult task. So we should expect hard work, right? And yet the call to, to image-bearing men remains that we were made to be providers. It's what we're called to do. And so this hard work won't be easy, but it's our responsibility nonetheless. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, for, for even when we were with you, Paul writes, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So that's a, couldn't be more clear than that, right? If anyone is unwilling to work, let him not eat. And so we shouldn't run from this hard work of provision. We should embrace it with a clean conscience, a heart of thanksgiving to God, right? He's given you the strength. He's given you the ability. We need to discipline ourselves for hard work, right? And what's that going to look like? Well, the fact of the matter is each of us has been created with unique sets of skills and interests and gifts to exercise for God's glory in our provision, right? The Lord created mankind to, to take dominion over all of creation. It's going to look a lot of different ways, right? That's a diverse human project that he's given us. And so there are all sorts of ways that you can play a small part in that work. So it's our job to take an honest assessment of how God has wired us. What gifts has he given you? What gifts has he not given you, right? And use those gifts to provide for your household. Each of us has skills, strengths, weaknesses, and so it's good for us to be honest with ourselves and assess what, what has the Lord equipped me for, what interest has he given me, and how can I use those, how can I steward those to glorify God, right? But, but for those who, who haven't, you know, many of us have settled into a career path, a, a job at this point, but for those who haven't, as you're thinking about that, right, take time to assess your unique gifts, sort through your Again, your skills and your interests, and look around at what's available uh, by way of work in order to, to provide for yourself and for your people one day. And the point is we need to use our uniqueness to provide for our people. And this is going to be a sacrifice, but God has called us to this. And so it's part of our role as men of God, right? 
And the last thing I'll say on that point, it, it can be easy to focus on the practical things. It can be easy to focus on the physical provision, and, and we tend to feel good about ourselves when we, when we make those ends meet. Um, but don't forget about spiritual provision for your households. Don't forget about spiritual provision, right? In other words, don't, don't get so caught up in the physical provision, working constantly to provide a home and food and clothing, that the enemy sneaks through the back door because you, you haven't provided anything on a spiritual realm, right? Again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about this in coming weeks when we talk about the fall, but it's actually that Adam failed to provide the word of God to his bride, which, which got us into the mess that we're in. There was, a, there was a lack of spiritual care and provision there. So providing spiritually for ourselves and our spouses and our children and anyone else who depends on us is actually a non-negotiable based on God's word. So again, we don't want to take pride in the physical quality of life we provide for our families if at the same time we're failing to nourish them spiritually, right? So the fundamental reason God has placed us as heads of our household is to bring honor and glory to him. And so when we neglect our people spiritually, we're failing in our mission as image bearers. So again, don't settle for bottom shelf provision. There's a, there's a reason the Bible says you're worse than an unbeliever, we saw it earlier, if you don't provide those basic physical needs, because even pagans know better than to let their children go hungry, right? If you're providing physically, you're at the first rung of faithful headship and, and leadership, but we must graduate beyond that to faithful, God-centered spiritual provision, right? And just like the physical, it has to begin with ourselves. It has to begin with ourselves, right? It's, it's, it's like the, uh, the oxygen masks on the plane, right? Secure yours <laughs> so that you can go help somebody else, right? In the same way, spiritually, we need to be well-nourished in order to outflow to our people, right? You can't give them what you don't have yourself. So saturating ourselves in the word of God, right? Pray, being a, a faithful uh, prayer warrior and, and being intimately woven to your Lord in prayer and in his word, that's going to be crucial for any provision you're going to be able to extend to your people. A couple of passages, uh, Ephesians 5 verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Then Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Right, so it's, it's our responsibility to provide spiritually for our families, right? But even beyond our wives and our children, remember what, remember what we heard a couple of weeks ago. In, uh, this is Mark 4, verse 21. Pastor Seth preached this. He said, And Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? Remember that? And so... Is this not a call for all believers to be shining the light of the gospel to, to everyone we interact with? It's not just about our families. It's about everyone in our sphere of influence, right? We want to be spiritual providers for whoever the people are that, that God has placed around us, right? So that's a little bit on provision. Okay, let's talk about protection. Let's talk about protection, ways that we can be better protectors. Well, again, first and foremost, we want to not neglect our call calling as protectors. God has called us to this work, to protect ourselves and our people. It's what he's made us for. So we should accept that calling with faith and obedience and joy. Thinking back to the creation narrative again, God also expected Adam to guard or to keep the sacred space that God placed him in in order to, to keep uncleanness and impurity out. That was part of Adam's task. And as we know, he failed in this, in this work of protection. So protection is a, a big 
deal. And so we have to resist the temptation to, to lazily pawn this work off onto someone else. No, we need to take pride in the calling God has given us to protect. And we should do it with joy and skill and our best strength. There's a reason, I think, that we're always so attracted to those epic, heroic movies and stories, right? There's just something in us that longs to protect and provide for the people who need us, right? That's a good thing. That's, that's God-designed. It's a quality that God has given us as image bearers and specifically as men, right? It can often be twisted sometimes, though, into something sinful. We have to be, be careful about, you know, pride and, and arrogance in these sorts of things. But the fact that we're naturally wired to protect is a feature, not a bug in the system. Okay, it's a good thing that God has designed us for. There's a reason, you know, even little boys, you, you, you see little, little sister getting picked on. There ought to be something in him that says, no, it's time to go to war. Because <laughs> not on my watch, right? That's, that's a built-in feature. Um, and that's a, gift, that's a gift of God, to be a protector. So as we think about being better protectors then, we need to embrace, especially as fathers, we need to embrace those uh, daddy is my hero moments. We need to soak those in as long as they come, right? Those, those moments where, where our kids get their, their understanding of God is shaped largely by how we love and protect them, right? We have to realize that. Um, and the last picture we want to paint for them is a lazy, disengaged God in the heavens who cares more about his own comfort than their safety and security, right? God is the, the hero of all heroes, and he's the protector, the shield, the savior, the deliverer of all of scripture. And so we're imitating him as we do these very same things for our people in protection. So husbands... Be the knight in shining armor for your bride every day. Do your best at that, right? Make sure that she knows that, that you have her back. And your mission is to provide for her and for your children with a, with a safe and secure life as much as you're able. That's meaningful. That's shaping her. Obviously, accidents happen, right? And tragedy strikes from time to time. But one of the ways we protect our people is by preparing for those sorts of things as best we can, right? Setting, setting some money aside for an emergency fund. That's a way that you can protect your family. Equipping yourself with some knowledge and some skill, right? To, to problem solve, to be able to fix issues around the home. It's a great way to grow as a good protector. We want to bless our families by, by physically securing the space around us. That actually matters, right? That actually matters. We want to do it the best we can. Legitimate locks on the doors, right? Fix that door that you've been, you've been putting off. You know, you've got to fix that doorknob, and I have one in mind that needs to be done. Silas, you will remind me to fix it. Fix that lock because it will help your family feel safe and secure, right? Security systems, lighting, weapons in the home, even a good watchdog on the property. All that stuff matters. And it gives your family a, a feeling, a sense of, of safety. Um, but even beyond home security, again, we want to let our people know that we, we care about their physical protection at home and away. And away. So, so we want to pay attention to who our kids' friends are. We want to have, an, you know, you're, you're mingling, we're kind of talking in the lobby or in the gym or whatever. You've got an eye on where the kids are. We all know that, that dad move. You kind of do a quick count. Some of, some of us, that's, that's tougher than others, but you, you kind of keep an eye on who, who your kids are with and where they are and, and, you know, all those sorts of ways that we protect our family. That's our calling. And these simple ways help us to, uh, to protect as, as masculine protectors that God has made us to be. But at the same time, it's not just about physical protection, like we said with provision, right? There's a, there is a spiritual aspect to this as well, right? Just like provision, we, we cannot neglect to protect our 
families spiritually. That means paying attention to what our wives and children are listening to, what they're watching on TV, on the internet, what they're soaking in by way of entertainment or media. All of that sort of protection matters. We need to regularly assess who has a voice in the ears of our people and what do those influencers believe about God, right? What, what is their worldview? That, that, that's important for us, right? We need to assess what kind of sermons are our family listening to, podcasts and movies and shows. All these things are shaping their minds. And so we want, to have, we want to have good tabs on those things. Again, may it never be the case that our homes are physically well protected, you know, the, the best locks you can imagine, yet the souls of our people are abandoned and unprotected, right? May that never be the case. So we want to guard against the, the negative influences at, at all costs, yet one of the best ways to do that is by providing them with the positive influences, right? That which is good and righteous and holy. So as we've said before, this must begin by a, a healthy assessment of our own hearts and souls. What, what's, what is nourishing us spiritually? What, who has our ear? Because the, the overflow of our heart is going to extend to our people, right? So we need to do what Adam failed to do in the garden and establish ourselves as godly providers and protectors, right? Does that make sense? Still with me? All right. Um, last little part here, last little part here is ways that we can help others thrive in their callings. Okay, so we, we're understanding what God has made us to be and to do. How can we help others thrive in what they're called to be and to do, right? Um, so whether they be fellow men or women, God has designed them as either protector providers, as we've talked about today, or, as Pastor Seth talked about, helper life givers, right? You're one or the other. Um, and so let's talk for a minute about our spouses. Let's talk about our wives for just a minute. How can we see to it that our wives are able to thrive as helpers, right? As helpers. Well, the first, first thing we need to do is realize that, that it's our responsibility to lead them in their calling and help them see it and, and recognize it, making sure that they are in an environment which is conducive to their thriving productively as helpers. We want to let them do what God made them to do. All right, so what does that look like? Well, an easy one, you might say. Uh, when you come home from a long day of work, <laughs> when you come home from that long day and your head is spinning and you're, you're kind of there but you're kind of not, right, and she asks you how your day went, and you say, fine, what's for supper, All right? Am I the only one who's ever? Okay. Um, maybe that's a temptation, maybe not, right? It's actually, it's actually your responsibility to give her insight into how your day went and details about how your work went. Why? Because God has given her to you as a helper, right? She has, she has tied her entire life to you and to your work and to your calling. So she deserves some insight into how that's going, right? God has given her to you as a helper, right? And, and she wants to help you succeed in building your household for God's glory. So it shouldn't be too much to ask to give her an update on how your work is going, right? Um, as, the, as the primary laborer in most cases and, and worker, it's, it's, it's helpful for her to know that she's truly helping you. How can I be an encouragement to you? She can't know that unless you communicate well with her, right? So communicate well with your help meet. Glorify God in his work. Show him that. Or maybe you, maybe you have relationships with people in your community, right? Neighbors, maybe, who are just, they're, they're convinced of the world's way of thinking, right? Namely, that, the, that androgyny is the goal of humanity, 
right? I don't know if you've noticed, but that tends to be the, the, the Kool-Aid everybody's drinking, androgyny, blur the categories, male, female, other, right? That's, that's the, the language our world is speaking, and maybe you have people in your life who are, who are bought into that, right? Call those fellow image bearers to something greater. Through your words and by your example, show them what healthy masculinity and femininity looks like. We can do this. Bring them around the community of faith. Invite them to church, right? Allow them to, to see what, what men who lead by taking responsibility actually looks like in real life. They may have never seen it. Or, or women who thrive as helpers and life givers. They may have never seen that. Invite them to, to church sometime, right? Again, use your sphere of influence to point those around you to the Lord and his good design for humanity. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, hopefully those are some helpful categories for us to think about um, with this conversation of celebrating our distinctions as, as men and women. Um, we're gonna continue in this series next week uh, we'll have a combined session. Pastor Seth's going to teach that. And, uh, and we're going to look at Genesis 3. We're going to look at the fall of, of mankind and, and why we are in the mess that we're in in terms of these things. Um, but let's, let's, uh, let's close in, in prayer for now on this. Let's pray.